Welcome, Igniters! I'm Michelle Cavetto, and I'm your host for today. And today we have a fantastic guest. We have Kathy McAfee. But before we go into our interview, why don't we learn more about all of her accomplishments? When you look at the focus of Kathy McAfee's body of work, you will quickly realize that excellent leaders are not born they are forged. And Kathy McAfee is leading by example. She is an executive coach, author and speaker, and the champion for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Known as America's marketing motivator, Kathy works with companies who want stronger, more diverse leadership pipelines across their organizations. She also works with motivated professionals who want to be known as experts in their fields. 16 years ago, Kathy left the corporate world to become an entrepreneur, a journey she highly recommends recommends to anyone with a spirit of adventure and the stomach for uncertainty. She specializes in the arts of high engagement presentations, relationship-based networking, personal branding, and leadership development. In fact, Kathy is the creator of the Fearless Leader Program and has authored multiple business books, including Networking Ahead and Defining You, of which you can learn more about Kathy and her work by visiting her website, thefearlessleader.com. A fearless leader herself, Kathy holds a second-degree black belt in Taekwondo and is an ovarian cancer survivor. She has trained thousands, been seen on talk shows, podcasts, conferences, and a TED Talk reaching countless of thousands of viewers. And now she is on Ignite Your Essence. Please welcome America's marketing motivator, Kathy McAfee. Hello, Kathy. Hello, Michelle and all the igniters, welcome to our dynamic conversation. I'm so excited <laughs> to be here. Oh, wow. Well, we're so excited to have you as well, because there's so much to unpack with you. You have in, ignited so many people. And so in order to delve into your essence, I'd like to ask you your first question. So Kathy, what I wanted to talk about is something so powerful. And it's I'm already seeing the ripple effects. And that is your fearless leader program that the fearless leader program. But before we delve into a little more of the detail of that, could you please give us a definition as to what you consider a fearless leader is? A fearless leader is someone who can navigate around obstacles while still feeling fearful. So by fearless, I don't mean the absence of fear. I mean the ability to move through it. Uh, in fact, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, one of our past presidents said, and, and courage and fearlessness, by the way, I consider them interchangeable, but he said, courage is not the absence of fear, but rather the assessment that something else is greater and more important than the fear. So the people that I have studied, the leaders that I have followed, um, those that exhibit fearlessness, they are able to stay calm, stay cool, get connected, get creative, and find a path forward. And, and just imagine all that we've been through, through the pandemic, 2020, 2021, all of us had, have had opportunities to call up the fearless leader within us to make it through. Yes, I love that. You know, that definition is so different. A lot of times when you hear a fearless leader, we hear of somebody very totalitarian. In fact, I remember uh, one of my teachers, uh, Dr. Carolyn Mays, she was saying that if we were truly fearless, we'd be, become monsters. And yet your definition is really in sync with that. You're talking about the fact that a person is going to have fear, but they're able to move around that. Can we talk a little more about some of the tools that you use? Obviously, we don't have enough time for your whole program, but what can a person do right now in order for them to kind of take that step where they want to take the lead, but they're afraid? Let's kind of boil this down to something basic. Okay. Well, there think, is, oh, yes. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, I think it starts with our, our, our beliefs, our belief systems. And so many of us carry around self-limiting beliefs. Things that served us in the past, kept us safe and protected in the past, but now they're stopping us from pursuing our goals and dreams. So every so often, each of us has to really take a look at those self-limiting beliefs and we have to bust through them. So that is one of the, the foundational exercises. We actually do that in week one of our eight-week program. And it's amazing what comes up. Sometimes it's what other people have been telling us for years and years, and then we adopt. 
or sometimes it's just the stories we make up about ourselves in the world. And it literally stops us from moving forward. So that that's kind of ongoing work that fearless leaders have to do. Uh, and then I would also say, uh, Michelle, studying courage. Because as you, you just described courage, kind of take the hill, the, the physical risk, life and limb, the, the military, the police, the athletic fearlessness, that is one kind of courage. That's physical courage. But there's a whole spectrum of courage. There's social courage and emotional courage and spiritual courage and moral courage. And I love this one, intellectual courage courage, the ability to speak truth to power, to really examine and decide what is true and what is fiction. Um, so there's all kinds of courage, which builds our fearlessness. Um, and we have to build that full spectrum. Wow. So a person is able to not only pick one of the courage, the at courage aspects that w resonates with them, but it sounds like you have a bigger approach where you can expand them to really stretch them. Is that correct in the Fearless Leader program? Yes. And yeah, so we identify what is your natural go-to source of, of courage, okay? You kind of live there, you're comfortable there. And then what do you need or where are you weakest and what do you need to build? Courage is a muscle. Um, so especially, for example, uh, emotional courage, you think about all the frontline healthcare workers in the pandemic, imagine the emotional courage it took them to do what they did, to see what they saw and to go back the next day and the next day and the next day. So people that are dealing with suffering um, and I mean, that takes enormous amounts of, of emotional courage to keep showing up and doing your best. Wow, that is so fascinating. You know, one thing I wanted to ask you about this. So there are people who have courage to respond. And they, like you said, with uh, the healthcare professionals, and then there are people who have courage to endure. Now, mm -hmm. I'm going to take you back to myself 11 years ago, and I served on my very first really big board. And I didn't want to take the lead. And Kathy, I could have taken the lead of this one, this uh, one committee. And I, I didn't have the courage to do that. And I was so frustrated. I was, I was coming home and I was, I was telling my wife, oh my goodness, this is this, this, that. And, and she said, why didn't you step forward and take the lead? You know, you can handle this. What happens when you're in that situation? How do you make that course correction? Right. Right. And it's in the moment, isn't it? Yes. I would put that in, in social courage because social courage, we have to face the risk of rejection, embarrassment, and even failure. And so we may not insert ourselves, raise our hand. Uh, and particularly with women, we don't feel we're ready. Like we have to be 100% ready before we step into the arena. Men, not so much, you know, maybe 20%, they just go for it. <laughs> of course, I'm generalizing on gender, so please forgive me. Uh, but I've seen this with many of my, my female clients and leaders. Um, we're just not ready. We don't feel ready. We actually feel like an imposter. So with social courage, we have to risk rejection. So let's say in that situation, you raise your hand, you say, I'd like to take that leadership. And what if they don't agree? What if someone objects? What if someone doubts? You know, how that, even just the fear of that, Michelle, might hold you back. Um, so I would encourage all of our igniters on the call today to have the social courage to take the risk to insert yourself and ask for what you want. Ask for that leadership position. What's the worst they can say? No. And then you can ask again the next week. <laughs> so social courage, um, we all have to build that muscle. Um, that's one that I quite honestly, believe it or not, I fight all the time. Just making a phone call to a client that I need to speak to or a prospect, just picking up the phone can sometimes require an enormous amount of social courage. Cologne had, had just asked a question. She said, what about the courage of, of being courageous? What she said, what about having the courage mm -hmm. to act on behalf of others, but not on our own behalf. Mm -hmm. Could you answer that for us, please? Yeah. We've seen that a lot. Um, I'm thinking of the brave young woman um, who filmed the murder of George Floyd, who had the wherewithal 
to pull out her phone and film a, an egregious act that lasted, you know, nine minutes. Um, and she didn't think about it. She didn't run a scenario. She didn't think about what risk am I posing myself? She just, she acted in the moment. And actually that was a fearless leader moment and it changed the world. Now I'll tell you, um, you know, she suffered greatly for taking that act of fearlessness, the, the emotional impact, the, the post-traumatic stress disorder that she's suffering, the guilt for not rushing in and helping him, which could have actually put her in harm's way. Um, so acting on someone else's behalf takes courage and sometimes it's physical courage. It's it's like our protesters. What does it take to, to go on an organized peaceful protest? A whole lot of courage, a whole lot of courage, um, but certainly standing up for someone else who's being bullied, not supported. Um, you know, even in the workplace, uh, someone has introduced an idea and someone else has has claimed it their own. You know, having that person's back, echoing um, that no, the source of that idea was Ava or was Eva Lee's, and I just want to you know say well done. That takes courage. The more you practice, the better you get. Wow. And then you'll be a fearless leader. It's <laughs> a that moment. And the more you do it. And here I want to tell you, I, I've really thought a lot about because I have been challenged between fearlessness because some people feel that's foolish or um, reckless, um, you know, without regard to consequences versus courage, which has some thinking and intelligence and analysis to the risks and you still act. I actually, here's the way I, I, I figure out the how the two interact. I think fearless is a spontaneous moment. It's a feeling, it's an action, potentially without regard to consequences, uh, but you do it and then courage carries you through every other moment and step. So with, like fearlessness is the igniter. It's the thing that gets you started. Courage, courage sees you through. Yes. And so it would seem that as we unpack your the Fearless Leader program, what you're showing is the fact that you have a system to help people. Uh, Sharon Sanborn, she wrote the book Lean In. And there's so many people who are so ignited by that. Mm -hmm. But now everybody's like, OK, I leaned in. Now what? And now it seems like you've come forward with the Fearless Leader program mm -hmm. to really show a system that you can do this where you don't have to make it up on your own. It's not a big gamble. You can actually really strengthen that muscle of courage, like you were saying. Am I, am I getting this correct? Yes. And and the Fearless Leader program is, uh, is an eight-week group mentoring program. And you're invited to go to a showcase event that's happening tomorrow at 3 East Coast. Monday at 11, or excuse me, Monday at 1 p.m. and fr this Friday at 11. So I'm going to give you a taste of it, and you're going to meet some graduates from the program. And we're going to look at that question. What would your career look like if you were more fearless? Like, what, what is the vision? What are you going for? And what do you need to do? So the things that we're really addressing with Fearless Leader Program is we're, we're building your leadership skill. There's actually skills that you need to continue to develop in order to be ready to make those leadership decisions and have that influence. We're building your confidence so that you believe in yourself, you know your essence, your values, your worth. Um, and we're also building the courage to go and do it. And there's a lot of other things. We, we really uh, examine our level of self-awareness. In fact, one of my favorite um, modules that we do is on conflict resolution. Because I got to tell you, conflict scares the bejesus out of me, right? I want to <laughs> avoid it, avoid it, avoid it. And we learned that there's actually five different styles of resolving and, and dealing with conflict. And avoiding is one. But so is competing. And so is collaborating. And so is compromising and accommodating. But depending on the situation, what the conflict situation calls for, you as a fearless leader are able to adapt and adjust your response or your team's response to fit the situation. So I, I really, until I built the fearless leader program and studied the Thomas Kilman conflict mode instrument, that's the assessment that we take. It's a fascinating study. And I think everyone should really dive in. And I would also say that um, I no longer see conflict as a threat. 
as something to avoid and to be afraid of, conflict is an opportunity to create new options. I learned that in the Fearless Leader Program. Because now you have the tools and you are sharing those tools. <laughs> Thank you for aggregating that. We did have a question by one of our, our viewers, um, Gabby Rodriguez. She, hit, she had asked, why, if I feel courageous and scared at the time, am I being a, a, a hypocrite? Uh, is Am I being a hypocrite to myself? Is it a valid feeling? I'm sorry. <laughs> Great question. Is it a valid feeling? Yes. Yes, yes, and yes. It is totally valid. Because remember, fear is biologically programmed. It's in our it's in our amygdala. It has fear has function. It has kept us alive. It keeps us out of danger. And unless unless you don't have a brain, if you don't have a brain, you, you probably won't experience fear. But if you have a brain, um, you're going to experience fear. And so again, um, not having what's called an amygdala hijack where the primal, you know, reptilian part of your brain takes over and makes you do dumb stuff, right? Um, which could be even stopping you from pursuing your goals. If you can have the skills and the reflection and the resources to work through it while it still exists, fear is still there and you're still going to deal with it. In fact, one of my favorite books is in my bookshelf by Susan, Dr. Susan Jeffers, Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. And she has a mantra that I just love. I must have read her, bag, her perennial book about five times. She said, you have to convince yourself and say to yourself that no matter how awful the situation, I can handle it. Right? There's fear. There's bad situations. I can deal with it. If you can kind of talk yourself into you have the ability to deal with this horrendous situation or this good situation, it will help you feel the fear and do it anyway. And I do wanna just build one COVID related add on to that. Okay. Because here's the deal, and we all learned it in COVID, you don't have to do it yourself. You don't have to do, you don't have to handle it all by yourself. Um, you can tap your resources, other people, to help you handle it. And here's where mental health and mental um, well-being, uh, we've all been through a lot of stress uh, and a lot of fear and a lot of death and loss. Um, and yes, we can handle it, but not by ourselves, with other people, with community, with other igniters. Absolutely. You know, when I think about you, Kathy, I think of you as a community builder. And uh, because of the fact that how you really ignite people's essence to not only understand the different aspects of courage, but you really in your fearless leader program, you tend to really focus also on entrepreneurs. Last year, last week, we had Dame Doria Cordova, and we talked about how there were more entrepreneurs this year, especially in Los Angeles. I, you, you were present as well. Mm -hmm. And what we found out, and I'm going to repeat this because I still think it's astounding, how California, starting last year, issued the most business licenses than it ever had in history. Those are entrepreneurs. So what about a person? What's holding them back mm -hmm. from becoming uh, fearless in their entrepreneurship. Do you have an answer for those individuals who are thinking about that and they're on the fence? There's so many people I've spoken to uh, who have corporate jobs, but yearn for the entrepreneurial adventure. And I was speaking to one this morning, actually. And so she shared with me what her, her vision, if she was more fearless with her career in 2022, what would it look like? And then I said, what's holding you back? And she said, job security, a regular paycheck, poverty, this, guess what? Fear that there won't be enough. Fear that I might not be successful. Fear that I'll, you know, have all this financial stress. And while there definitely is financial, you know, reality to entrepreneurship, and you, you got to know your numbers, you got to, you know, know how a P&L works, staying someplace because you are afraid and you feel like you're more secure, you might actually be fooling yourself. I don't think there is, there is no such thing as a long-term job. There's no such thing as a permanent position. Would you agree? Absolutely. In fact, um, I had what many people thought was, um, felt was a dream job. And certainly I had, I had status, I had 
uh, business coming out of the ears, but I had seen how my employers were running the business and it wasn't exactly the way I wanted it. And I could also see that things could go a different way. And so that's when I started my first company. Of course, I don't recommend somebody working full time and, ha and starting a new company, but that's what I did. And that was my journey to entrepreneurship because of the fact that there is no stability, not since pensions in the 70s. In Stanford University, you studied economics and you've studied all of the different types of models out there. A lot of people don't understand that who haven't studied economics. We just accept what's being told to us. Mm -hmm. Now, you said that people are afraid that there's not enough. And that's why, because you were listing off, you know, putting food on the table, rent, all the survival aspects. What do you have to say about the economy that will give people comfort to be more fearless in their endeavors? Mm -hmm. I love it. Actually, I would say I would recommend they do just what you did. Uh, have a long kind of crossover runway. So have that full-time job. It's just like going to school while you have a job. A lot of people do that. Have that full-time job and then save that money and then start building your concept and your team and your network. And then at some point it's going to be a natural, you know, switch over. But the more back to Dame Doria and all the wisdom she provided, if any of your igniters missed that show, you must watch it. Um, it's a note taker. It's so inspiring, but you have got to, if you want to be an entrepreneur, if you want to have a successful career in life, you got to figure out how money works. Um, one of my favorite gifts for, for the holidays, by the way, for any, any child, I, I don't know if it's still in production, but it should be on, in every home is the four stomach piggy bank. Teaching children at a young age that there's more than just spending that you can do with your money. You can spend it on things that you want. You can save it for something you want in the near future. You can invest it long term and risk it, but you know, you want to put money there and you can give it to charity. You can help other people. So by taking even a dollar and putting four quarters, each one quarter in each of those buckets, we're building, we're enjoying today and building for the future and helping other people. So um, I think if, again, take, take a financial literacy course, I encourage all of my fearless leaders, especially the ones that have all these amazing like six figure salary jobs. What? You don't have a financial planner? Are you nuts? Get one get one. I, I will tell you, I started at 35 uh, and I went kicking and screaming to my first financial planner. Most of the cool things I've done in my life, someone has had to drag me there, including my black belt in Taekwondo. I had to get dragged there, okay? But I went. I went reluctantly. Why? I didn't want to look stupid like I didn't know money. Well, I was stupid and I didn't know how money worked, but I learned. So I started at age 35 and now I just celebrated my 60th birthday. I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. You look fabulous. Oh, I, I feel fabulous. <laughs> I'm alive and kicking. But I'm in such a better state because I started early. I started investing early. And the earlier you start with your financial planning and investing, the more your money will grow and accumulate and, and just do its thing. Um, so I encourage all of you would-be entrepreneurs Go have, go have a conversation with a financial planner and start your investing now for the future. Wow. You know, you just make me think of when you read about demographics, uh, you hear that the Gen Zs, they're a little more savers. Of course, they have no problem spending their parents' money. And, and then we have millennials. And uh, one of our producers, Ivalise Cologne, she was talking when we were discussing about having you on the show. She was mentioning how... Uh, there's going to be a huge transition of wealth among the uh, uh, millennials. And there's a lot of people who have six figure jobs already. There's a lot of people who are inheriting this wealth, but they don't exactly have that financial literacy. What would you recommend to people? Because it's difficult to lead when you're bleeding out money. So what would be your advice to those millennials who are watching today? Awesome. Well, you've got to get your own financial house in order. So personal finance, work on it. Uh, you're really role modeling. And then as you take over your business and you, um, you know, or you're leading a business, you treat it like your own money. In fact, I had a, a savvy 
CPA accountant who, you know, we, we were early in our entrepreneur. Uh, by the way, I'm married to an entrepreneur. So we, we, we live a high risk life. We both have an unsteady income every day. I'm looking for work. You know, every day we're doing business development. But he, um, so he went to her and he said, well, end of the year, should we go buy some office equipment? Should we spend in expenses so that we can have write-offs? And she said, never spend money for a write-off. Only spend money if the business needs it. And that was a sit up in your chair going, hmm, you know, she, I think she has a point. Why would I buy all this stuff just to write it off? And, and then I've just got stuff. Um, so being the CFO of your business, uh, that's really important and you can't outsource it because if you don't know your numbers and track your numbers and know if you're profitable and where the profit comes from, you got to spend time on that. That's, that's what it is to run a business. Um, so entrepreneurship can be very sexy and like, oh, I have all this free time and I can be creative and you get to be the CFO. <laughs> Roll up your sleeves, figure it out. You can do this. Wow. You know, um, what you're just discussing is is really like it's it's the path. It's really the path of the entrepreneur. You said you are the CFO of your own company because you're wearing all those multiple hats mm -hmm. and understanding the fact that you actually are holding or are wearing those hats really does create the opportunity for people to actually seek help. Like you said, we can't do this alone. So we weren't born. Uh, financially literate, just like we weren't born literate to read words. And so I, it's just, you really hit a point there. And I don't believe that you and your husband are unusual. Um, I do have a question here though. Hey, Kathy, I have a question. How could my life improve if I become more fearless by nice. Lauda Ibarra Creative? Nice. Well, uh, I see in Lauda's case, uh, by being more fearless, she could uh, connect with people that on Clubhouse and, and uh, social media and say yes to opportunities and suddenly be part of an amazing team of powerhouse people from all over the world. So Laura is a living example of being fearless and courageous and inserting herself saying yes to opportunity and creating amazing things. Um, so I would say all of you who are asking that question, how will my life improve if I'm more fearless? You just got to go experience it. Uh, and it's, you know, you've got to just say, yes, you have to move forward. You can't just sit there and analyze everything to death and do nothing. That's called stagnation, right? It's the opposite of inflation, stagnation. It's just sitting there. Um, so we have to take a risk on ourselves. And, you know, Michelle, if you don't mind, I think it'd be fun to pivot to essence because igniting your essence means to me you have to believe in your essence. You have to know yourself. You have to know your values and your desires and your motivations. Like, why do I want that? Yes. Can we unpack that a little more? Kathy, in order to ignite your essence, you also have to know what feeds you. So can I get a little personal with you? What exactly feeds you? What keeps you effervescent so that you wake up every day and say, hey, I get to start a new day. I look for work. I, I close deals. What feeds you though? What keeps you going? I do love to close deals. There is one, <laughs> so many people hate the sales process. I hate selling, get over it. Sales and marketing. They're two sides of the same coin. Sales is serving. When you That's sell someone, you are in service of someone. Um, and there's nothing, no, there's a really great dance you get to do when you, when you land an agreement and you get a deal. It's very exciting. However, um, what really ignites me is the opportunity to be of service, to help someone, to make someone have a better day, um, to empower someone, um, to have someone understand their true worth. So for me, it could be as simple as, um, you know, if I'm in a hotel and, and I know that there's these invisible workers, they're called like, uh, you know, housekeeping, they're invisible, right? We don't even acknowledge that they exist. But we know they're there and they serve such an important job. So here's here's a little thing I do that just makes me feel so good. I, I leave a tip. I leave a $10 bill in the hotel and I write a note and I say, thank you for your service. Your work matters. And I sign it, Kathy. And sometimes it's fun to take a picture of the, of the cash and the card and just so you can know, hey, I did a good thing today. Somebody 
feels valued. Um, that, you know, that makes my day. And I will also say the other thing that just brings me alive is just the opportunity to be creative. Um, I, I'm a writer. I love to write. Um, I love to blog. Um, but I also love to create visuals. And that is a new skill for me. And there's uh, websites that entrepreneurs should discover, uh, like Canva.com. The, the woman that created that um, company did extremely well. She might make an awesome guest for your show, for Igniters. Um, but I have kind of figured out how to work it. And even that image you showed, the Fearless 2022 showcase, I did that. I did that. Because my graphic designer is retiring and my virtual assistant wasn't available. And so what do I do? Just sit there and wait? No. Sometimes as an entrepreneur, you kind of give it a go. <laughs> and I loved it. And I feel like I'm, you know, I know I can't, I'm not going to be a professional graphic designer. I'm not not nearly that good. Not like Laura Ibera. Um, but I can dabble and I can do something. And that, I don't know, that makes me happy. That ignites me. I had a really okay. ignites you. Wow. You know, when I when I talk to you, we see all this information, the fearlessleader.com. Please check this out. This eight week program, I think what it'll do is really make some it frees somebody up. It makes somebody be more creative, like you're saying. I love what you said about giving and being of service, and especially of the service industry and acknowledging them. I feel that there is a part of integrity that comes from an individual who can acknowledge that it didn't that they didn't get through life just by themselves. Somebody made their beds at times. Somebody was there to present a really nice, safe place to stay, like in the hotel and such. And with that integrity, you also think of other qualities. And you know, I was just thinking about the Los Angeles Tribune. And uh, Mo Rock, who's the CEO, and, and of course, there is uh, Natalie Forrest, who's the COO, two amazing individuals who really have been become part of the Los Angeles Tribune. And they have built upon this history something that really does have an illustrious uh, history of bringing not only news, but bringing people like yourself, Kathy, you know, before we continue, I'd like, just like to share with everybody a little something from the Los Angeles Tribune so that we can understand what this platform is about. Why don't we watch that right now? Hello and welcome to the Los Angeles Tribune. Since 1886, our name has been a part of the world of journalism. We've earned a reputation for being a publication that practices integrity, authenticity, and responsibility. For general inquiries, contact today. Thank you on behalf of the Los Angeles Tribune team. And we're back with Kathy McAfee. I'm Michelle Cavetto, and we're continuing to talk about the fearless leader. Dot com. And also, too, you can check out more information about Kathy McAfee at the fearless leader or fearlessleader.me. But I'd like to kind of go a little personal, if you wouldn't mind, Kathy. I'd like to know you a little more as a person because I feel that people are really inspired. When you ignite your essence, you also talk about really where you have come from. And you've come from an amazing place of where you experience some strife and also have broken through that. You know, I often say, Kathy, that the most motivating, the most inspirational, and the most supportive individuals on this planet have gone through some of the gravest situations in their lives. You seem to really fit that bill of very motivating, very inspirational, and very supportive, especially with your programs and also your giving. Could you kind of give us a little glimpse as to what made Kathy McAfee today? Oh, that's 60 years. That's a long story. <laughs> All right, you know, let's condense it. I will share with you the highlights. One, one hardship that really changed me, changed me for the better and helped me reconnect with my essence and gave me a bigger reason, a bigger vision um, to be of service. And that is when I was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. 
I think I was 49 years old. I discovered it in a really funny way, Michelle. Um, I was taking my Taekwondo martial arts and we practiced barefoot for kicking and punching, just part of the, um, the ritual. And, you know, warming up, getting ready for class. And I'm looking down at my feet and I noticed that one of my feet, I, the way I described it, it was fatter than the other one. It was, it was like swollen, just like weird. Now, we can just ignore that, like, oh, that bump, that doesn't matter. Oh, that foot, uh, you know, that's nothing. Get over it. But I just, I noticed it. And the next day and the next class, I noticed it. Then I really noticed it when it started to crawl up and I started to get a, a swollen calf and a swollen knee. And then it went into my thigh. And I remember giving a, giving a motivational talk um, at a client's office. And I had to sit down because I was so fatigued. And I had to put my foot up. And, and I was wearing kind of wide-legged pants, uh, fashionable at that time. But I was like the Hulk. One of my pant legs were almost popping at the seam while the other one was fitting nicely. And at that moment, I knew, pay attention. Get yourself to a doctor. Do not ignore this sign. Your body is talking. So then uh, I went in. And um, my family, by the way, has a history of ovarian, ovarian cancer. Um, but they were all 80 when they had it. And here I am, 49. Um, so I w underwent a hysterectomy and they indeed found ovarian cancer in my fallopian tube. And when I woke up from that surgery, uh, kind of shocked, of course, you know, drugged out from just the anesthesia. And my husband said the, the hardest words that you ever have to say to a loved one, you've got cancer. Um, and then the cycle started. Now, I wish I could tell you I was fearless. I was brave. I said, I can handle this. No, man, I thought, I can't tell anybody. No one will hire me. They'll think I'm like the walking dead or my life's over, my business. What about all those appointments? What about those speaking engagements I worked so hard for? It was a, um, yeah, I was kind of stuck in this really pity me. The world's coming to an end. Um, I didn't want to tell anybody. And then um, I think I had actually a competitor, a, a friendly competitor who I called to see if she could fill in for me. And I went into my pity party complaining, which I'd done like 19 times that week. And she said, I can't believe I'm talking to Kathy McAfee. I always thought you were so positive. And I was like, oh, 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 enough already, enough. So at that moment, I just kind of accepted my situation. And then I decided, you know what? I can't control everything in my life. Certainly not this, but I can shape my experience and I can, I can use a different approach. I can be more positive and creative. Instead of fighting cancer, I can maybe dance with cancer because I, I like to dance. <laughs> um, so I ended up doing all sorts of amazing things um, from shaving my head for charity uh, to doing chemotherapy parties. We actually got a private room. I had friends come. We themed it. We had food. Well, I got infused for six hours. Time just flew by. It was so much fun. I couldn't wait for the next one. <laughs> I know that sounds really bizarre, but it really helped me get through it. Um, and then on my, in my fifth month of chemotherapy, I booked a uh, photo uh, session with a professional photographer friend, Matthew J. Wagner. And he took the most beautiful, striking black and white images of me. While you're going through chemotherapy? Yes. In my fifth month, I'd lost all my head, hair. I'd lost... Um, my eyebrows, by the way, you do have an eyebrow bone. So the bone actually defines the eyes, but it's a lack of eyelashes that make you look like a cancer victim. But I wanted to bring this because I hang this in my office. So um, pardon the reflection, uh, but here are some of the images that he took of me. Those are striking. Wow. Amazing. Yes. So this, um, just capturing this moment for me was so meaningful. And I, um, I, I just, it was a, spe it was bizarre. I know it's hard, hard to believe, but it was a really special time in my life. I don't want to go through it again. I don't want to wish it on anybody, but it made me realize that I still have work to do. And then I have an urgent sense of now or a fierce urgency for t now to quote Martin Luther King to be of service, to make an impact while I'm still alive. Um, so that's when I joke to people, um, this is, I guess when you've tasted mortality, you can have a odd sense of humor about it, but I'm not dead yet. 
I am not dead yet. Let's get on with the business of living and giving back and helping other people. Wow. So sometimes that, that can help me tap into that fearless leader within, like, do it. What are you waiting for? You know? So have, that have that, the that courage. My <laughs> side. That's the bald side of me. So even, you know, even when my hair, my COVID hair is like, it's I, so I, illustrious. I love I'm it. So need a stylist, but you know, I was bald once, so I'm grateful for any bit of hair that I have. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can really relate to a lot of people, especially from going through 2020 and the COVID, um, not knowing and, and can easily be brought down and, and you had to make that course adjustment. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for sharing that. And the, oh gosh, those pictures, I, I never consider that. I, I actually have a photographer friend who mm -hmm. quite astounding and, and she had offered to come over. Uh, my, my wife has cancer and she said, and I didn't quite understand the concept that she was bringing up, but now I understand it's a, uh, it, it actually tells a story. And so thank you so much for letting us be part of that story. Awesome. You're working on a book, aren't you? I am. And I that am. This book is on the topic of being fearless leaders. I know we talk about a lot of it. And now you're taking pen to paper because you love, or should I say, fingers to keyboard. <laughs> but but you're, you're, you're compiling this. Is this going to be stories of examples of being a fearless leader? Could you kind of walk us through yes, what yes. this will be? I will tell you, it's not my story. Um, so I am taking more of a journalistic approach and I have been interviewing. I took the summer off to interview people, uh, some well-known, some not known at all, some just ordinary like you and I. And I wanted to hear their fearless leader. I called it a fearless leader moment that time where you made a bold, courageous decision and it changed everything. So I had such an inspired, ignited summer because I got to uh, interview people like Miss Opal Lee, the grandmother of the Juneteenth movement. She is 95 years old. Um, I sought her out. I heard her first on the Rachel Maddow show, uh, her story, what happened to her and her family at age 12. And I was just like, whoa. Um, and you should see what this woman has done and continues to do. So I wanted to kind of tap into her essence. What? How do you do that, Miss Opal Lee? I also had the privilege of actually um, enrolling her granddaughter, Dion Sims, into the Fearless Leader program. And Dion is going to be the successor to the charity that Miss Opal Lee has started. So that was super cool. Um, I interviewed Sam Goodwin, who is a world traveler, um, an entrepreneur. And he's one of the few people alive, like 12 people that have traveled to every country around the world, 194 right. nations recognized by the UN. That's tough and to do. He did two years and he was doing really well until he got to Syria. And then in Syria, he was arrested by some militia. They accused him of being a spy and they threw him in uh, solitary confinement. And he, no one knew where he was. So, so Sam's story is just amazing. You, you can see videos and interviews of him. But what I was curious about was when he was rescued and he got out of there um, and he recovered slightly at home, he got back on the plane and finished those 12 other countries to hit his goal. How did you do that? <laughs> How did you get back on the plane? Um, so he's just an amazing, inspired person. Um, I have interviewed uh, Judith Martinez, who started a program called In Her Shoes, who's focused on helping young girls. And in many ways, we're kind of mission aligned because she, she, um, she asks a compelling question, which I wish I thought of this. What would you do if you were 1% more fearless? Excuse me, excuse me, 1% more courageous. She uses the word courage. And so she's just igniting all of these young girls to embolden themselves, to follow their path early in their life. Um, so she's she's got a remarkable life story. So I have done, I think, 18 interviews. Um, and now is the hard part, you know, putting it into a, a book that makes sense. <laughs> but I think it'll be inspiring. Um, I think it will be educational. And my real hope, Michelle, is that all of the readers and all of our igniters will recognize that you are the leader of your life. You don't have to have a title leader to be the leader of your life. And there is a fearless leader within you. You just have to, you have to call it up. It's, it's 
calling and, and activating the fearless leader within. Um, so I'm hoping that when you see other people do these amazing things and overcome amazing odds, that you will see that you can do it too. That is wow. Amazing. Your book is right up my alley because that is exactly what I love to read because it's it's what inspires me. It ignites my essence to continue forward. And and quite frankly, I a long time ago, I used to run and I always found that I ran at a better pace when I had a pacer. And so your book sounds like these people have really set the pace and shown an example and they weren't well known until this because your book is going to really <laughs> showcase them. People are going to talk about these examples. And you know what? I encourage all of our igniters watching tonight. I want you to write your own story. You have so many. You do. You just have to give them value to acknowledge them. I know Michelle and you telling me your background, you've got a fearless leader story. So <laughs> that's one of the things, by the way, we do in the fearless leader program. We actually write our own story. And sometimes we're the hero of the story and sometimes we're the mentor. So I teach you how to actually uh, write a story and to shape the story and so that the story can serve others. Um, and then to add that to your communication tool bag, whether you're giving a town hall, a public presentation, you're onboarding a new employee and you want to teach a lesson or you want to uh, tell them a little bit more about you, you want to build that connection. You know, telling an authentic, real story that's not the, look at me, I'm perfect, but hey, I'm human. I've had hardship. I've found a way. And here's here's what I learned. And I want to, I want to give that to you. Oh, um, that so. is so timely because people don't want that chest thumping thing. We've had enough of that, decades of that. But now you're bringing real authenticity like yourself. I wanted to bring up a question, Kathy, and I wanted to get your opinion. Can we bring this up? We call it the question. It's by uh, Buckminster Fuller. And um, while they're bringing that up, I wanted to talk about something. You have a concept. You have a concept that you call global difference maker. And it sounds like this is what's evolving next from fearless leader. Did I get that wrong? Or is there, is there a, Thank you. that's a great idea. That's the <laughs> next big idea. <laughs> tonight I'm going to give it away for free. Okay. Wow. Global yes. difference maker, Global because difference I feel maker. people have woken up or ignited to want to make a difference. A global difference. You'll, leader. you'll see a map on my wall. And you also see a piece of art here that actually is kind of an artistic rendering of the world. Uh, we live in a big world and there's an abundance of resources an abundance of talent and abundance of need. And so your potential impact, whether you're sitting in, you know, Los Angeles, California, or, um, you know, England and, and London, England, wherever, wherever you are in the world tonight, you can make an impact uh, in other places, in the world. And so um, I, I'll tell you that you can claim that you're a global difference maker and strive to be a global difference maker. And uh, this term came up um, actually while I was getting a massage by my therapeutic massage therapist, Jolly Lux. And there's something about being face down on a table and someone giving you a massage. You can have the most amazing conversations, <laughs> whether it's you know in your home or professionally. But she was telling me that she had a vision uh, and a dream that she could give back to her home country of Uganda. Jolly is, uh, went through the process of being a naturalized American, Ugandan American, and she's lived here many years, but she still wanted to give back. And I was the very first person that she told this dream to while I'm face down and I'm listening to all this amazing things. And of course I had to encourage her. This is the essence. This is who she is. She is someone who makes a difference, who gives back. Why wouldn't you go for that? And why wouldn't we encourage that? And so I said, you know, I gave her my ideas and, um, and she, then she took it from there. So now Jolly has gone on and she's run this organization. It's called Guiding Light Orphans, Inc. Interestingly, her original concept was to help all the orphans in Uganda whose parents had died from AIDS. Through her research, she discovered in these rural villages, they all take care of the children that are orphaned. They're not like put in an orphanage. It's, it's it a takes community. a village. And what they really needed was healthcare, education, epilepsy treatment, 
So she, she did a beautiful job of really nailing what they needed and working it at a local level. So of course I love Jolly. Um, Jolly, by the way, yes, I talked her into being in the Fearless Leader program. So she is a Fearless Leader graduate. Yay. Um, <laughs> and I have become a sustaining donor. My husband and I are sustaining donors to GLOW, which is the short handle. And in that small way with a monthly donation, I am making a difference across the world. I don't know about you, but that makes me feel like, you know, I am a global difference maker. I'm not just keeping it all here locally, which there's a lot of local need. We have to address the local need, but there is an abundance of resources and connections and money and help that we can spread our wings. Um, so the other idea I want to give your uh, Igniter listeners tonight is the idea that you too can be a philanthropist. Oh, what do you mean? I don't have a million dollars. I can't give away all that money. I'm just we have to be as wealthy as Bruce Wayne. That's right. <laughs> you can actually legitimately say that you're a philanthropist today if you do what I did, which is write your will. So do that grown up thing where you sit with an attorney. It doesn't cost that much. Everyone should and must do this. You know, write your wishes. Don't don't die and leave a mess for your family. But what I did when I wrote my will is I, ready? I gave the first million to Cystic Fibrosis Research Institute to find a cure for cystic fibrosis, which was a disease that my brother lived with and died with. So um, my job, I have till the rest of my life, you know, hopefully I have a little more time to amass that million dollars or more. And when I die, I will activate my th philanthropy uh, promise by giving a million dollars to a worthy organization. So that is that is my like I don't have to have a million today. Um, I just have to be dead to act, you know. But anyway, you get it, you get it. So you can be a philanthropist, you can be a global difference maker. And I will tell you, I actually had to convince Jolly. I said, Jolly. You need to put global difference maker on your LinkedIn profile. She didn't think she was one. No, I'm like, oh. <laughs> if ever there was one, it would be Jolly Jolly Lux. Um, so if you yeah. think of yourself, if you aspire to be, if you have it in your essence to make an impact, to be generous, to help others, don't wait until it's perfect. Claim it today and then live into it. Live into it. Uh, Eva Lee's, thank you so much. Eva Lee's uh, Cologne had asked a question. Can we pop that up again? I wanted to read that. Um, she says, Global Disc for the Friends Maker. Uh, oh, what could your career be like in 2022 if you were just a bit, a bit more fearless? Well, if I were just a bit more fearless, Michelle, I would be on the Ignite Your Essence program. <gasps> I am here. <laughs> I got to tell you, it took a little courage to be here tonight, right? It took a little fearlessness to say yes to your invitation. So that's what I did. Um, and here we are. And we have lost uh, Michelle, but she'll be back shortly. I'm back she's now. Back. I'm back. <laughs> Sorry, the technical difficulties. And that's what happens when you have a live show. But now we know it's authentic. Well, thank you so much. So thank you for um, answering that. We have to actually have a, another question I'd like to ask you. Um, what difference uh, does it? Oh, well, there it is. Mm -hmm. Good. Good so this is what we call the question by Buckminster Fuller. How do you make the world work for 100% of humanity in the shortest possible time through spontaneous cooperation without ecological damage or disadvantage to anyone? Have you heard this? We call it the question over here. And we're always trying to answer this. How would you answer that? I'm just going to say one person at a time. If every we're, it's kind of like the butterfly effect. If if we all start spreading our wings and we can change weather patterns, we can whether it's our own behaviors, attitudes, how we treat each other, um, we make the difference. And of course, if then we can collaborate to solve these big problems. I loved Dame Doria's challenge. If you want to be rich, if you want to make a million dollars, you know work on and solve some of the world's biggest problems, homelessness and, um, you know, and the opioid crisis and the climate crisis. And of course that can be very overwhelming, but what's my baby step? What little thing can I do to make a difference today? And if that is part of your essence, that is part of your mission, um, we can, we can do it together. 
So part of my mission, Michelle, because you asked me in our prepara preparation, what was my legacy? Which is a question we all have to be thinking about. And yes. I, know I don't have the total answer, but I do want to, I do want to make life better for all people, but particularly for women and girls. I would love to eliminate um, and eradicate the imposter syndrome that women and girls never doubt their worth, their value, that they can show up um, with half the skill set and then, you know, amass the rest of it, that they can just walk into their brilliance. And then I think if they do that, if we could do that, no more imposter syndrome, then I think we can then chip away at the wage gap. Why is it that women still, after all this time, still make, and I, it might be seven or eight cents less, but for Hispanic women and black women, I mean, we're talking 54% on the dollar. That's a crime. Um, so I want to close the wage gap. Um, and I also want to eliminate the penalty that mothers pay. First of all, you got to, we force you to have the babies. And then when you're pregnant, we discriminate against you. And then you're out of work to raise the children. And then therefore you have a gap in your resume and therefore, you know, one wants to hire you. Yeah. Right. So what's up right. with that? Right. So those are two, I think things, um, and what I can do through my coaching and through the fearless leader program is I can give you the fearlessness and the courage to negotiate, to ask for what you want, to don't just settle or, or worse yet, discount yourself. And tomorrow you're going to meet Jackie Garofano. If you come onto the showcase fearless 2022 showcase free event, she's going to tell you how she did it. Oh and my gosh. Jackie can do it again. We're not Jackie, but uh, why can't we negotiate salaries? Um, why can't we ask for the fee that is commensurate with the value we're creating? Why can't we do that? We can. And by doing that, women and men helping women do that and men paying women equal value, um, we, we, are, we are individually and collectively closing the wage gap. It's the um, little things that matter. <laughs> absolute <Yeah>. little things. <laughs> that seems to be one of the issues that we definitely need to do. We need to close that gap. We need to, and also the gender disparity, as you brought out. Pew, Pew Research, um, They, you may have read this because being an economist where mm -hmm. they had a whole breakdown um, depending on race for male and female of how much everyone earned. And I, I was so shocked, like you brought up the um, Hispanic and african American population was very, very low. I mean, women were much lower than most men, but that is something there. It doesn't seem that that gap needs to be. And I loved how you touched on that, how doing the butterfly effect. But Kathy, it sounds like you've been doing a compilation of butterfly effects, and then you had to put together the fearless leader <laughs> program. And then now tomorrow we have the event that I highly recommend that everyone was there. We have the information that was not only across on the ticker, but also mm -hmm. too through the comments on Facebook. Do check us out. There it is again, Fearless 2022 Showcase. Ooh. And I cannot wait to hear especially the speaker that you mentioned. And I, I really feel that in order for us to collaboratively and spontaneously solve the world's problems, it really involves that connection that you said. Mm -hmm. And though it seems small, it's so big as what we can bring forward. I wanted to talk about diets with you also. I know we're going to do a little <laughs> shift here. I, I, wanted to, I wanted to do this because um, I found this fascinating. I, I remember we were discussing in one of our pre-meetings, you talked about uh, going on a financial diet and how shocking it was for you. Could you share with everyone? Because oh, yeah, every, yeah. a lot of people right now feel like they're on a financial diet already. And um, how do we turn something like that into something positive like you did? Okay. Well, first of all, this is not my idea. It's uh, Michelle's um, and her another Michelle, the famous Michelle. She works for the Washington Post, and she was a speaker for a couple of years at the YWCA Hartford's Money Conference for Women. I was on their board, um, and I went religiously for nine years, and I took copious notes. So Michelle introduces the twenty-one day financial fast. Here are the ground rules. You cannot use any form of plastic, no credit, no debit, cash only. You can only buy what you need, not what you want. And you have to journal every penny you spend for 21 days. 
And somewhere on my Facebook uh, history pages, I did it twice. I journaled for 21 days what I spent, what it was like, um, arguments I told myself. But it got easier. It was like a cleanse. Um, and so it's amazing what we think we need. We really just want it. We want that latte. We want we want that uh, Netflix movie or, you know, I want it now. That's when I discovered actually in those fasts, I discovered the public library has like millions of dollars of resources and it's free. And now they have Hoopla. You can actually down, you know, you get books, eBooks and movies. So there are resources where we don't have to shell out the money needlessly because we want it now. Um, and even going to the grocery store, she even made us or suggested we pay cash for gasoline. How many times um, do you go to the pump, you fill up, you drive away, and you don't even look? Now, maybe I might be. There, um, there's many people that are going, holy crap, it's $42, and I only have $12. Um, but we, we just are unaware of what we're spending. We're just getting it and going. Um, when you pay attention to the pennies and, and the nickels and the dimes, you will get richer. You will get wiser. And so you don't have to live like that, but just to have the experience of, if you will, a financial fast. It makes you, it makes you a smarter, richer person, more, more money savvy. Absolutely. And not only taking care of your own needs and desires, but it does free things up for that philanthropy that you're talking about, how all of us can be philanthropists. We just have to write it down. I, I've never even thought of that, writing down my will now. It's, it's so funny because a lot of people don't think about death, but when you're facing that, um, it, it kind of changes that perspective. But perhaps we should just write it out, just at least our wishes, because many experts say, including you as a mentor, that uh, if you actually set the goal, our brains tend to go there. Right. And that's, and, and how simple is that? And yet a lot of times we go wishing, but we never do actually put that down in paper. And I don't think any of us are getting out of this alive. So <laughs> now death is just like, it's just, just a transition, right? I'm in transition, uh, but we just want to be ready for all those things. The, the loss of a, of a job, the, um, the birth, these major things, the birth of a child, the retirement, you know, there's going to be life changes, whether you're 20, 40, 60, or 80, you want to be ready. Um, yes. so I do call it the grown up thing to do. Get your financial house in order, but getting a will, a medical directive, and a what's the other thing? Um, durable power of attorney. They come, this like a set of three things. Do it. Don't wait till you're like on your whatever bed. Just take care of it. Be grown up. Um, and it's an interesting process. It's, it's, a, it's a legal process. I think I spent $600 to get both my husband and mine done. Boom, done, grown up. <laughs> you can grow up with $600. That's right. <laughs> but you, you have know. to pay cash. <laughs> One, you know, Kathy, the two. reason why I wanted to delve so deep into all the different aspects of you, because you really are a well-rounded individual. You And what I wanted to really show everyone is the fact that in order to be a fearless leader like yourself and to teach fearless leaders, you got to live it. You walk the walk. And so I thank you, Kathy, for really exposing your essence and sharing a part of your journey and showing how you you turn things around. Losing your brother is something that's very traumatic. And yet you've turned that around and made that part of your legacy. And and you showed us how we can do that as well. Certainly, you're not the only one. None of us are going to be unscathed when it comes to things that are very challenging. But yet all this information, I'm just so wonderful. I know people are going to watch this on the replays as well. And I welcome everyone to make sure that you tap into those resources of with um, Kathy McAfee. She also mentioned others. Always a gracious, fearless leader when they can mention other people's work and promote that as well, because then you know they're the real deal folks then you know that they realize that they don't have all the answers but when they do have the answers you have to make sure that you you pay attention and you kathy are definitely somebody that i'm so thankful that we have on this planet and that we definitely want to pay attention to you because you're not done yet 
All Not of those global, global difference makers that we're all going to become and we're all going to be ignited. And you definitely are an individual that is pure essence, that is ignited. So thank you. Thank you so much. We can continue forward. And as you know, here on Ignite Your Essence, people like Kathy um, McAfee are definitely the type of individuals that we want to bring to you. There is positivity, folks, but positivity comes with action. And in order to take that action, you have to know the steps. And knowing the steps are like at the fearlessleader.com website and learning and maybe setting up an appointment with, with Kathy McAfee and trying to find out where you are sitting and how to find that courage. We could all use some, I guarantee it. So thank you so much. And I really welcome you to check out, as we ignited you, we want to keep you lit. And Kathy, I know we've mentioned our magazine with uh, Leaders and Transformation Lit, and we will learn more about you. In fact, um, we have asked Kathy to be a contributor, and she will share a little more with um, our upcoming issue. And so what I wanted to do, Kathy, is just to ask one more question to you. What is it that you want our viewers to experience in life in order for us to understand what it is to really feel like your fearless leader? There's a lot of fearless leaders out there, but they've never really felt it. Could you give us something to help us understand how to experience that? How to experience it? I'm thinking of a great quote from one of our first ladies, uh, do something every day that scares you. Uh, and it can be a little thing. Um, we just have to get comfortable dealing with fear and, and facing it and going, it's, you know, some, in most cases it is a perception. It's my imagination. So let me just meet it. Let me just, Feel it. Let me deal with that strong emotion and assess it um, and learn from it. So the old, you know, fear the feel, fear, feel the fear and do it anyway. But we got, we have to address the fear. And we also, Michelle, have to really, we have to work on our self mastery. We have to get to know ourselves and our essence and our shadows, the good, the bad. We are all paradox, you know, paradoxes of each other. I can be generous and kind. I can be mean and nasty. You know, I'm both sides of that coin. Um, but we do want to be the best version of ourselves. And so we have to work on ourselves. Um, you are never, you never get there. Boom, I'm successful. Boom, I'm famous. Boom, I'm rich. Hey, it's a journey. It's a journey of self-awareness, self actualization you know, not igniting your essence, but then not ignoring it. It has to be continued to be fed, developed, cultivated. So okay. the exciting thing is that you got, you got a full-time job there. It's a lifetime worth of, of learning and opportunity. So I encourage you to uh, join me on that leadership, that personal leadership and growth journey. Oh, wow. Thank you so much. I could continue on and on and on, but unfortunately we, we have to come to a close, but Kathy McAfee, thank you. Thank you so much for all that you shared this time, the knowledge and also sharing of your essence, because really and truly, if we can connect and we can be ignited, I guarantee you the world will be a better place. And so with that, I'd like to thank everyone for being here at the Los Angeles Tribune as we are on Ignite Your Essence. And we are going to be back next Wednesday at 5 p.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time, which will be eight o'clock Eastern. And we will be delving deeper as to the essence, but we're going to lighten it up a little bit. We're going to have Mr. Barry Shore, people. Barry Shore, he's going to talk Actually, um, we're going to move forward with that. And then also, I just want to remind you that I am not the only host here at Ignite Your Essence. We are going to have Michelle Wilson, and she will be debuting on January 6th. So stay tuned for that. And I wanted to also remind everyone here that you are your own essence. So delve in deep, as Kathy McAfee said, get to know yourself, self-mastery. We hear that a lot. Dean Doria Cordova also said with the last episode, and also remember 
to always find reasons to smile. I'm Michelle Cavetto, and I wanted to thank you. And on behalf of the Ignite Your Essence team, we have Shamiko Cole, Ava Manuel, Lauda Ibarra, Gabby Rodriguez, uh, Carlos um, Esparza, and of course, the lovely Ivelisse Cologne and Michelle Wilson. We all thank you for tuning in and stay tuned for next week because folks, we are working hard to make sure that we bring quality uh, people to you as well as information. So with that, I want to wish you a wonderful evening and a beautiful morning for those of you around the world. And don't forget to find every reason to smile. Bye. Thank you.